This video is going to be my second preview of the Ravens Seahawks matchup in week nine in Baltimore. This is going to be a look at the Seahawks defense and how aggressive and physical and disruptive they are. I'm going to show a lot of the turnovers they forced uh, this season. And we'll show some Ravens film where the Ravens have struggled with, with turning the football over. As a Ravens fan, uh, you probably know they have, we have 10 turnovers already this year, I believe. Now our defense has forced 11, so it's kind of ba balanced out. The Seahawks defense three times this year has forced three turnovers in a game. So that's why I think this game, the result of this game, has a wide degree of variance because the Seahawks offense has a difficulty turning the ball over, particularly lately. Up through week six or week five, Seahawks only had one turnover offensively. They since had seven in the last three games. So when I say there's a wide degree of variance, keep that in mind as we go through some of the film that's going to be heavily weighted towards showing Seahawks disruptive plays that force turnovers. I think they have the potential to do that. Three turnovers every game, well, no. But I think this is the type of defense that's been constructed via draft and coached to force turnovers, to be aggressive and get after the football. There's more players than just the ones that are showing up on your screen in the scrolling picks that are involved in these plays. I, I got to get a little statistical stuff out of the way before we start the film where I'll break down you know, at least 25, 30% of the plays that you see, but some of it will just be plays to show you uh, the type of defense they're playing. Uh, Seahawks come in allowing 20 points per game, 19.7, uh, 11th in the league. But if you look at their last three games, when they're 2-1 and one against the Bengals, Cardinals, and Browns, they're only allowing 15.7. The film that I have is generally focused on those three games. Uh, they did beat the Browns last week at home, 24-20 uh, to 20 in the last minute of the game. Offense has turned the, ball seven over, seven, oh, turned the ball over seven times in those three games, like I mentioned. So there's the possibility that either of these teams could be plus two on Sunday. If the Ravens are plus two against the Seahawks on Sunday, that's a bad formula for Seattle. West Coast team coming in here playing at 1 o'clock on some levels at a little bit of a disadvantage because of the time start. Flip it the other way. If Seattle comes here and they're plus two in the turnover margin, they have the type of guys on the defensive side of the football that don't just get turnovers but take it to the house. Ravens have had a real issue with turnovers in 2023, as we mentioned. That's well documented, I think, by more people than just myself. To me, that's where this game hinges. you got to be able to stop the run or limit the run for on both sides of the ball. But turnovers is going to play a huge element here and could cause this game to flip drastically, plus 8, plus 10 points one way or the other, based on what it, quote, should be if it's an even game in terms of turnovers. I think the Seahawks defense has big play ability. Having forced three turnovers of games, like I said, against the Panthers, Giants, and the Browns last week. Uh, there are a lot of players involved in this from a Seahawks perspective. Again, my film focuses on the last three weeks, but also have significant film of them against the Lions in week two because I cover Lions content as well. It's more than just Reek Woolen, um, who actually to me looks a little bit more handsy this year than I recall from last year, but maybe that's just my memory being faulty. Devin Witherspoon, the rookie, is unbelievable. I think Boye Mafe is a potential star. Uh, he's a great run stopper. That was what he was billed as last year. He only had three sacks as a rookie. He's got five already this year. It's a shame that Uchenna Nwosu uh, is out for the season with a pec injury. seems like those injuries are happening more often to people. Trey Brown, the young rookie corner, has a pick six that I'll show you in this video. Julian Love and Quadre, Quandre Diggs, excuse me, the safeties. Jamal Adams kind of moves around. they got 26 sacks uh, this year. Only allowed eight passing touchdowns so far in seven games against six interceptions. Defense is allowing 6.2 yards per attempt, which is somewhere around like 10, 11, 12th in the league comparing to everybody else. To me, they're really great at turning you over in certain games. And if they come into Baltimore and they're able to force a couple of turnovers, it drastically could swing this game in the other direction. We don't need very much reminder, but I recognize that there'll be Ravens fans and Seahawks fans that watch this video. So we have had trouble. Some of our turnovers have been unforced, like this one against Detroit, up 28 nothing, going in to possibly make it 35 nothing. I mean, if we keep this football, Lamar is out the gate at the top side of the screen with the potential for a big play. The turnovers have come in the run game. They've come in the pass game. They've come occasionally at times with poor pass, pass pro that allows uh, guys to get to the quarterback, and they've come in the form of interceptions, like this one week six um, over across the pond. Lamar targeting Rashad Bateman to the bottom side of the screen. These things have plagued us at times and made certain games closer than they should have been. 
games where we felt we outplayed the other team for the better part of two, two and a half quarters and were unable to get separation because we turned the football over twice. If the Ravens don't turn the football over offensively and they slow down the Seahawks run game, the possible outcomes for this in terms of final score flips drastically in the Ravens' direction. Not that the Seahawks' 11 personnel groups with their three great wide receivers aren't going to be good enough to score points, but trying to make the Seahawks' offense somewhat one-dimensional and not turning the football over ourselves gets us on the right track towards a winning formula. Let's put it that way. Let's get to some of the film of the Seahawks, and they force turnovers in unique ways at times. This is end-of-the-half situation, week two against Detroit, so it doesn't result in points because I think it's actually the last play of the half, perhaps the next to last play, but they don't give up on plays. Uh, this is Trey Brown down here up against Iman Ross St. Brown, and what struck me about this, this is Iman Ross St. Brown doesn't fumble. He doesn't fumble and he doesn't drop passes, and this is the these guys play – with the type of tenacity and aggressiveness that forces fumbles. This is Uchenna and Wosu. He'll be forcing. This is the very next offensive snap for the Lions, but this was the first offensive snap of the third quarter, and this was huge. This was huge, along with the pick six that I'll show you in a minute by Brown, Trey Brown. These guys get after the football and have the potential to turn the Ravens over if we don't protect the ball well as a running back or we don't pass pro well. They play, I like to say, downhill these guys play downhill and they're, they're extremely athletic i would say this is probably the most athletic team that we've played this year in terms of the sheer number of really good athletes that they have this is another turnover detroit had three in that game maybe you could say the first one quote doesn't count because it was the end of the first half but this guy can play man trey brown when you see devin witherspoon play in slot he's not here by the way and you're like, well, who's this 22? Well, he's good. He's a really good player. Doesn't just have great ball skills and great instincts. Tackles well. You saw him force the fumble by St. Brown to end the half. This was a huge moment. Seattle's able to get up 10 in the fourth quarter. Detroit, of course, stormed back to force overtime. Uh, Jared Goff has talked about, he's taking blame for this, I think, talking about throwing the ball behind Gibbs. You get the end zone angle of this one. But they're the type of defense, if you ask me, that the Ravens, certainly can't be conservative against because you have to put up points. They're talented enough offensively to score, even against our defense, which we know is incredible as well. But just so you know, I will come out with a film set, a film session Saturday morning that will be what the Ravens can do offensively to possibly make plays against this defense. Again, they're, they're only, I say only, 11th in the league in points allowed, but it's, it's, Less than 20 per game, and I think it's trending down over the course of the season. By the way, the guy who got the pick six, the play that I just showed you, Trey Brown, the play before that one, he got a sack. They have guys who can make plays across multiple levels of the defense, coming downhill, at the line of scrimmage, moving backwards in pass coverage. That's why I'm showing you this film if you're a Ravens fan. This is the same play, um, end zone angle, just so you know. Again, the play before Goff's. Pick six to Brown. There's Brown right there. Taking on Craig Reynolds. Able to get to Goff for the sack. This potentially is a nasty defense that I love two of the things they do. I'll talk about one of the coverages they do uh, Saturday morning, but this is one of the things I've seen on film enough times such that I think it's uh, quite intentional. Well, it's obviously intentional, but it's quite intentional, and they use it expertly like at the correct time this is what i would say is like a reverse power play the guard is going to kick out the fullback is stepping off the midline and then he's going to lead through up to the um inside linebacker as opposed to what you would normally get on a power play where the fullback kicks out and the backside guard wraps up to the inside linebacker this is reverse power they're wrong arming with the front side defensive end i think it's 52 and then Wagner is folding over the top. It's a gap exchange. Now, additionally, the backside D, D tackle slash DN97 is kicking ass with the tight end for the Lions. So you've got a wrong arm here and a gap exchange. Let me draw that so you see it because I don't know if I give you the end zone angle of this one. So he's going to go inside of that block by the guard. Wagner's going to fold over the top. He, they would have stopped this play regardless, but as it turns out, they didn't need it because 97 is winning down here against the backside tight end, and then he's going to get involved in a play. It's a little bit of a slower developing run play. Well, let's just see it maybe two more times through so you can see the running backs 
little counter step, the fullback stepping off the midline. They're not able to – the wrong arm technique – is interesting against the Ravens because if we run option, I wonder if they're going to take away the give to the running back and basically force Lamar to keep it. Let's get to some Week 8 film um, against the Browns. It's a blitz by Brooks, 56. Force fumble, uh, Week 8 against the Browns. They are tremendous playing downhill. So this is a stunt that I've seen them run multiple times with safeties, linebackers. It's quite basic. Uh, out, the DN slash outside linebacker, speed rush, outside rush, whatever you want to call it, and then a late insert into the B-gap by a slot defender, inside linebacker, nickel. The D-tackle's job is to um, occupy the guard, make sure that the guard can't pick up that blitzer through the B-gap. It's a, it's a kind of a safe blitz in this situation because you do have a safety lined up down there to the boundary who can help out with a hot to this guy. Tremendous when they play downhill. The Ravens have got to figure out a way to prevent them from being so aggressive. I don't know if that screens. Maybe you might see a reverse this week. I think that's possible. I'm not saying that it will necessarily work against the Seahawks defense, but the speed with which they play, especially when coming downhill on stunts against the run, blitzes, you might see a reverse in the in the um, in the game plan and early. This is uh, Reek Woolen. Sorry, I almost called him Tariq Woolen. It's his first interception. I almost said finally. It's like not fair to the guy because he had such a an unbelievable historic season last year that you expect that he'd have interceptions already. Kind of an overthrown ball, but there's a little bit of pressure in, um, I think that's Walker's face. I think the pressure is from Boye Mafe, who, like I said earlier, you, you may not share my enthusiasm when talking about him. I did a video on him last year, I think week eight. I included him in a best rookie um, edge edge rusher video that I did that I'll link up here if you didn't watch it last year. Sorry, I had to make a time note. If you didn't watch it last year, I recommend you go back and watch it because it's cool to, to see whether I'm right or wrong about certain guys. Mafe, Tracy Walker, Aiden Hutchinson. But you can see he's winning against this guard on this inside stunt, and they're bringing Witherspoon off the edge. Witherspoon is a powerful finisher against the run and when used as a blitzer. This is going to be a penalty on Woolen at the top. I'm going to include two instances of this. It's a fourth down, so he gets a stop, so he's excited. Gives a little punch to Amari Cooper after the ball was snapped. That's not the, the penalty. The penalty is once the ball was in the air. He's punching Cooper. Cooper escapes to the outside. It's a fourth and two, so Tariq Woolen knew that he didn't have to flip his hips and go. wasn't going to run a vertical most of the time. The ball's out maybe just a touch late, an eighth of a second late. And Woolen is challenging it, gets called for a DPI. If you're a Seahawks fan and you're watching this long, first of all, thank you. But second of all, you, you, know, you probably disagree with the call. You can let me know in the comment section if my observation is, is accurate. It seems like he's a little more handsy down the field this season, and maybe that's the reason why he's been called for more penalties. But I understand that they want him, they want him to be aggressive. They want to make, make it life miserable on receivers that have to deal with such a great athlete with such length and explosiveness. Boy, am I fake. Um, I think four or five weeks from now, the guy's going to have eight or nine sacks. I don't know what the other pass rush situation is, is like on the other side, uh, but this is a guy who is huge, incredibly fast. Uh, he played kickoff team last year. The video that I did about him that I mentioned earlier, I showed him on kickoff twice making tackles. I think he's a special talent because of his mixture of size, speed, and athleticism, and then he's an ass kicker against the run. There's always times in a young player's career where they become something that they supposedly weren't a month ago or two months ago. I think the ability has always been there for uh, Boye Mafe. And now you're just seeing the fruits of it in terms of the sacks. But I think other than sacks, he gave the Seahawks defense those things last year. A little bit of a touchy penalty, I think, up here on Woolen. This is a incomplete pass down at the bottom side of the screen. Trey Brown in coverage, I think. If they get him, I, th I believe, for contact to the face. Uh, this one, you know, is definitely contact to the face. I'm not sure that it necessarily needs to be called, but nonetheless, they do call it. It's a third down, gets a first down. The film that I have, I have four separate penalties on Woolen that have given offenses first downs this year, so I think that's significant. Interception, I believe, by Julian Love against the Browns with two minutes left, and this is significant because this is what allowed the um, 
Seahawks to go down and get the game-winning touchdown, the, the pass to, to JSN. This is on that same blitz that I described, except it is a slot defender. Again, it's Jamal Adams. Good to see him back um, healthy and playing extremely well. I like how they move him around a lot. Sometimes it seems like they use him at nickel. Sometimes it seems like they move him to inside backer. But you got an outside rush by the D end, and then Adams through that B-gap blitz, D-tackle occupying that guard. So it's just a free runner. It's a free runner. They clearly ha- are good, very good, I should say, at understanding protection schemes by the O-line and the running back. So in this case, the running back is on the opposite side. The stunt is called because they, the Seahawks, know he's going to be opposite in protection. So the, the right tackle is going to have to deal with the speed rush. The right guard is going to deal with the D-tackle, and that opens up the free lane for Jamal Adams. I think it hits him in the helmet, but it's a design stunt into the B-gap. A hot route over the middle or the the Z under to Amari Cooper gets deflected up in the air, and this is the type of thing they do. They they bring chaos. It's what defenses should do. Especially when you have this many athletes running around. This many young athletes. I know Bobby Wagner's been around a long time, but they've got a lot of young athletic guys. It is Boye Mafe over there. It is not Boye Mafe. I apologize. I was wrong. This is uh, Clark. Off Adam's helmet. It looks like he tried to lean into it or he knew the ball was coming at him. Huge play because not that long thereafter, with less than a minute left in the game, they catch the Browns in a somewhat similar blitz off the edge and JSN behind DK Metcalf's block scores what ended up being the game winning touchdown uh, 24 to 20. Rewinding back earlier this season, one guy that you have to talk about. <laughs> Another rookie corner having a great season. This one is a little different from Reek Woolen in that Devin Witherspoon, Witherspoon plays in the slot some as the nickel. Sometimes he plays his outside corner to the left. Occasionally you've seen him lined up over here to the top side when maybe they're rotating Woolen out because you have Trey Brown. So you have three really talented, super athletic, smart young corners, Witherspoon, Woolen, and Brown. I think the Ravens are going to see all three of them. When the Ravens go nickel, it's going to be really interesting. To, excuse me. When the Ravens go 11 personnel or 20 personnel, where Pat Ricard, our fullback slash tight end hybrid, is our fifth position player besides the running back and three receivers. it would be interesting to see how the Seahawks match it. If you're a Seahawks fan, you've been watching this long. Thank you. First of all. Second of all, when we bring Pat Ricard on the field, most teams respond with their nickel. And the Ravens, in a lot of situations, are going 20 personnel meaning one running back or tailback, either Gus Edwards or Justice Hill, and Pat Ricard as the fullback slash tight end, and three receivers. Defenses are matching with their nickel, and the Ravens are able to run the football extensively against those looks. Now, this is another sack by Witherspoon. You should recognize the stunt. Edge defender rushing outside. Witherspoon ends up... Mano Imano with the guard wins along the outside, but it's a slower developing uh, pass play. Josh Dobbs gets sacked. Now, just so you know, this one didn't count. This one doesn't go on Devin Witherspoon's ledger in terms of his stats because there's another penalty on Reek Woolen. Am I saying that you can expect him to get one or two or three penalties on Sunday? No, but there's been enough this year that I think it's more of an issue in 2023 than it was in 2022, but I'm basing that on the three, really four games, counting the Lions in week two, four games that I've looked at extensively. So if you're a Seahawks fan and you get offended by it, I'm not sure what to tell you. But second of all, correct me in the comments section um, if I am wrong. Pick six by Witherspoon, 97 yards against the Giants. What else needs to be said? The guys, they have guys on the field who make big plays and can threaten your offense in a way that other defenses can't. This The reason for me showing you this film as a Ravens fan is these guys are the most athletic group of defenders that I've seen. They just traded for Williams, the D-tackle from the Giants also, by the way. They're, this is the most athletic group of defenders on the field at the same time that I think the Ravens have seen this year, along with the Browns. Those two defenses are the most, and, and we scored 28 points against the Browns. Two of those are somewhat related to turnovers by the Browns' offense, which goes back to my point from the beginning of this video, that turnovers by either team 
are a huge determining factor in this matchup. Now, that's a really easy way to talk about a football game because it's always turnovers, right? But for this Ravens team and this, and this Seahawks offense, both of which have had difficulties turning the football over at times in 2023, I think it makes it a game I would not bet on. I saw, I saw the spread earlier in the week. Someone mentioned it in our Discord, and I thought that was too wide of a spread for the, for the amount of talent that the Seahawks team has. Even though the Ravens, when they play at their best, like they did two weeks ago against the Lions, are an extremely dangerous team, possibly one of the two or three most dangerous teams in the entire league to deal with. You guys let me know what you think of my thought that this is a game I would not bet on because of, I don't bet at all anyway, uh, but if I did, I still wouldn't bet on this one because of the ability of both defenses to turn the football over through plays that are somewhat unpredictable. Nickel blitzes, force fumbles on on blitz on uh, on sacks, interceptions, or in the case of Devin Witherspoon, you saw the pick six. We all know what Reek Woolen did last year when he was named Tariq Woolen. Uh, historic season that included all different types of turnovers, fumble recoveries, and plays. We are in for a treat in terms of watching these two teams go at it. I think this is absolutely another game that is a Super Bowl type collision that we get to watch in week nine of the NFL. There's multiple games like that going on this week. The Chiefs and Dolphins clearly can't play in the Super Bowl because they're in the same conference, and that one will be on Sunday morning, which me leads me to my last point. Usually I do previews on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings. I'm not sure that a preview I put out on Sunday morning is going to garner a lot of views, or maybe people would even want to see that content because the Chiefs and the Dolphins will be on early. So I've tried to push my previews a little early. If you didn't check it out already, I did do a preview about the Seahawks running game. I'll do a more extensive look at the Ravens' offense Saturday, against the Seahawks' defense Saturday morning in terms of showing the, the Ravens' plays that have worked consistently during the year and that I think could work against the Seahawks group. Appreciate you guys' time, man. Please let me know what you think 